Tom asked me to come and do this talk. Uh, uh, Tom did a uh, training for us at uh, Expert Support um, last fall and asked me to come and, uh, and do this one. I, this is the same talk as I did at uh, Berkeley uh, back in August. Uh, so if anyone was there and uh, wants me to do something different tonight, uh, <laughs> Richard Tom. doesn't get a vote. So, uh, <laughs> it's, the, it's basically the same story. Uh, and as I said uh, to the folks there, uh, the, uh, somebody asked me whether or not there was brand new information in here. And the answer is no, this is old. Uh, it's nearly as old as me. Uh, and uh, back in the uh, 80s, um, I worked at Technology, which was one of the high flyer artificial intelligence companies. And I'll tell you more about that as we go through. Uh, but the basic picture with this, uh, with this discussion is uh, to transmit some of what we learned doing expert systems for major companies that I think apply directly to uh, technical writers and the task of technical writing. So uh, we'll start out, you know, simple model of technical writing, right? What does a writer do? It learns some domain, yeah, you learn some domain information and then you write documents, reference manuals and tutorials and user guides and stuff like that. And that's what we do, right? Um, and that simple model I'm going to expand on and because I think this really doesn't do it justice. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll do a fancier model, uh, which I'm not going to, you know, now it's just, you know, that's where we're headed. Uh, and let's uh, uh, start in on how we're going to get to that uh, fancier model. So we'll start with AI. Uh, what is it? Anybody uh, want to toss out what what does artificial intelligence mean to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we get it working, it won't be artificial anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, that's one of that's one of the things. Is uh, as soon as you figure out how to do it, it's not AI anymore. Uh, that's that's uh, well, one of the definitions. It's it's giving an artifact something that we would think is intelligence, right? So divided to some artifact. Something we would recognize as yes, and and, and yes. Yeah, so, so it's it's providing an intelligence to a uh, a computer program, a robot, a, you know, whatever, um, so that we would look at that behavior and decide that it was intelligent behavior. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, everybody in on that. So um, uh, you can ask Google what Google thinks. And so it's relatively uh, straightforward. The theory and development of computer systems capable, able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, translation between languages, uh, other things like that. And the such as is uh, really are uh, the, the centerpiece here, because when you know when we really start talking about it, um, it's. The techniques and the research and you know the work is slightly different as you work around the different parts of the such as uh, and in particular for purposes of tonight I'm going to be paying much uh, I'm going to be paying most of our attention to expert systems um, also known as knowledge based systems so ever ever since uh, Watson won on Jeopardy uh, <laughs> I I believe now. <laughs> Uh, Watson, Watson is a uh, is a is a pretty substantial advance. Uh, you know, we, it's 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 done a nice job, especially with things like natural language understanding and uh, and well, let, let me do a little quick. Yeah, so robotics, vision, uh, natural language understanding, speech recognition, expert systems, learning. Um, le learning is another one of the big ones these days. Is um, there are uh, there are a bunch of advances over the last five or ten years with um, a, a looking at patterns in big data and extracting things that you you know that humans don't even find out. So the, learn, the, the whole learning world is is really an interesting advance. I haven't kept up with it, uh, so I don't really know anything about it other than you know layman sort of thing and and just pay attention to some of the stuff that flies by, but. Uh, uh, some very interesting stuff. So let me talk about expert systems. Um, the simple definition is uh, you want to build a system that performs at a level that you would consider 
expert if done by a human, right? So we typically look like, look at a population where, uh, you know, you take a bunch of accountants, for example, and uh, what characterizes the very, very best of them, and those are the experts, and then uh, can you build a system that uh, performs as they do better than the norm, okay? So, uh, and that's, that's what we were doing. During the, in the 80s at Technology, uh, we built expert systems for uh, companies like General Motors and Procter and Gamble and Mutual New York and Shell Oil and uh, lots, and lots of big, big companies. At that point, um, building an expert system was typically somewhere between uh, you know a million and three million dollar development costs, uh, and uh, you know so you had to have a pretty good substantial app to drive the ROI. Uh, you know, that would say yeah, this is worth doing. Um, I'm going to use an example uh, for, for this purpose that was one of, our, one of our big successes. If you look at the history of AI and expert systems in particular, uh, there was a big run-up in the 80s uh, where a lot of hype and a lot of, uh, you know, it, it, this is going to be the greatest thing and all that stuff. Uh, and then towards the end of the 80s, uh, there was the, uh, the, the equivalent of the dot-com crash in 2001 uh, was the uh, AI crash in, in about 88, 89, uh, where uh, people got discouraged. Now, one of the reasons for that was that when we were building these things in the 80s, almost never could we talk about our successes. So uh, this, uh, what I'm going to tell you about right now, um, only recently, you know, are we sort of able to talk about it. Um, General Motors Acceptance Corp Corporation, GMAC, is the uh, financing arm of G General Motors. Uh, you may have bump bumped up against them in uh, commercial, you know, in a uh, personal lending thing, you know, uh, finance your car uh, through GMAC. Or, so they have a consumer division. But the big thing that they do is floor plan financing for dealerships. So they, you know, GMAC typically is holding most of the paper on most of the vehicles that are in some uh, lot that, you know, as you go shopping for your Chevrolet's. So uh, the application that we did was uh, there was uh, a set of accountants at uh, GMAC who could, by looking at a series of books from a dealership over a period of years, uh, you know, quarterly books and, you know, where, you know, look at the time sequence and see that either there was some mismanagement going on or there was potential fraudulent activity uh, going on. Uh, the big thing that happened with GMAC was people, you know, a dealer would run off to the Bahamas with a pile of money and, and leave GMAC holding the bag on. Uh, now they own a bunch of cars that they don't want. Um, so, uh, fraud and mismanagement was was the uh, was the deal. They had experts that could, by analyzing a set of books, uh, typically predict six months, twelve months before any kind of default that the pro that the business was in in trouble, you know, either on purpose or not, but uh, that the business was was going to have problems. Yeah, if it was say it was managed well, but for some reason that was the wrong neighborhood for it, and they weren't selling. Yeah, right. So mismanagement in the sense that there, there that the, the it, was headed for a it was headed for a failure. Maybe the you know they, they weren't paying attention to cash flow. They weren't you know they were you know over stocking you know to you know, run their campaigns and then not turning the inventory over fast enough. There were I I don't know the details. I you know I'm not the expert here. I wasn't on the project. Uh, one of our guys actually who works at Expert Support was on the project. Um, but uh, the, the deal here was that, you know, with all the dealerships around the country, these three guys that knew how to do it couldn't keep up with doing the analysis. It was a couple months worth of analysis that it would take somebody, you know, human uh, looking at a set of books and stuff like that to come up with, okay. And it's one out of, you know, thousands uh, that, where you're going to find that needle in the hay haystack. So it, it looked like a pretty good uh, uh, application for expert systems. And... Um, yeah, so we uh, we ended up it ended up being a uh, four company project, GMAC leading it, 
uh, we were doing the AI part of it. Uh, AMS, American Management Systems, was doing the accounting part of it. And EDS, um, which is General Motors IT shop, basically, um, EDS uh, was doing all the infrastructure. Ross uh, Perot. Ross Perot, yep. yep. So uh, anyway, it ended up uh, uh, that, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out as we go, but so expert systems. So what is it? What is it? You have a subject matter expert. In this case, there was these, you know, guys from the uh, uh, in, in the accounting world that knew how to look at the books, knew what they were looking for, uh, and would it, it look at the details of uh, of a sequence of uh, financial reports and determine that there was a problem. Uh, there's the domain in, in this case, accounting and accounting records for uh, General Motors dealerships. It was actually very specific that you know there was you know there was it's not just sort of any old accounting it's their particular thing and it's the the associated task was that that analysis of what they were doing. Uh, expert systems then attempt to perform those tasks with measurably better performance than the norm. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, you know there was a, a whole collection of people in the uh, accounting at at GMAC that were looking at these books. But there were only a few of them that were uh, able to catch this particular kind of problem. Uh, then, for building them, understand what the what knowledge the subject matter expert uses. How do they? You know, what do they do? What do they look at? What do they do? How do they? You know, what calculations do they do? What search do they do? All that, and then develop an application that performs at or better than that expert level. So that's what an expert system is about. And um, uh, then let me talk a little bit about how you build them. Any questions so far? Okay. All right. So, so here's here's the way that it goes: is you have a knowledge engineer. Uh, that's me for now. Uh, the knowledge engineer is is uh, the person who acquires knowledge from the subject matter expert, uh, also from domain information in general. You'll read books, you'll you know read reports, you know that kind of stuff to come up to speed on what the domain is. But the primary source of the information that we're going to use in the expert system is going to come from a subject matter expert. What's the reason for that? Well, the, the reason is that we're per performing a particular task, and that particular task isn't in the books. You know, you can do accounting, you know, da, 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 but that's not going to say what is that guy looking at when they're looking at, you know, this dealership's books over, you know, a period of seven quarters. What are exact, what's exact, you know, so it's, it really has to come from a from a human expert. That's why they can perform better than the norm is because they know stuff that the norm doesn't. Okay, so um, so that's so the knowledge engineer's job then is to get the knowledge, and then there's the mental model. Uh, that means that that knowledge engineer has to create something that makes sense of it for them. Okay, so. Uh, th this, as I was telling Tom, this is a talk that I'm uh, uh, going to build at some point, is to talk about this modeling activity, because uh, I think that's it's, uh, for a lot of reasons, but uh, uh, th that talk isn't ready for, ready for prime time yet. Um, so the knowledge engineer creates that mental model and then encodes it in a language appropriate for you know some computer to run. Uh, back in the 80s, we were building... Uh, uh, IDEs essentially uh, uh, development environments for expert system building uh, that were pretty fancy tools that incorporated um, uh, rule-based reasoning and a bunch of other you know, things that I won't go into for you know, technical reasons. Uh, but the knowledge engineer would then encode this mental model <coughs> to create the computer program uh, that's going to attempt to perform uh, the task. And then there's a user out there uh, who runs the system and then is performing some tasks, you know, this task that we're talking about, at a level uh, close to the close to or exceeding the, uh, the, ex the expert. Um, so the, uh, you know, some of the key pieces in here are the modeling and encoding thing. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, uh, the one of the one of the interesting pieces here is um, if you compare this to conventional software building, 
um, you often find this person actually being two people. One person, sometimes called the business analyst, that talks to the customers and finds out what they want and what they need and writes requirements documentation and specs and design docs sometimes and that kind of thing. And then the programmers who take that information and, and build it into the computer programs. Uh, we found that that didn't work for us, uh, that, that even one level of telephone tag uh, was enough to keep us from being very successful. So we, we didn't have that separation. Our knowledge engineers were people that had both the technical skills uh, to build the system and the social skills, the interactive skills to acquire and um, and model the information from the uh, from the subject matter. So, yeah, right. So the the mental model of the SME. Well, I'm curious about the mental model of the, of the knowledge engineer. Is mm -hmm. he trying to reproduce the mental model of the SME, or is he trying to produce a mental model that is uh, that is consistent with uh, encoding capabilities that he's going to have to use? Both, both. It's a it's an excellent question. When, when this knowledge engineer, a lot of people look at that term as, you know, hype that, you know, okay, yeah, you had to make something up because you wanted to be different than, you know, and all that. But there's some real, real content in there. Knowledge engineering really means taking knowledge in one form and engineering it to do something specific, right? So, I mean, I could tell you how to get to my office in Mountain View, right? Uh, and uh, I could give you a declarative version of it. Um, you know, we're in, a, in an office space on San Antonio and California, uh, near what used to be the Sears Shopping Center, and I could dot it on, you know, tell you a bunch of things, and you go figure out how you're going to get there, mm -hmm. right? Or I could say, go out here and turn right, and then turn right, and then turn left, and then turn, you know, and give you a very procedural view of how to get there. Uh, and and the, the real answer is you'll get something from the SME about what they think they do, and we'll, we'll get to some of this. Yes. But this is a re-engineered version of this. Okay, so it's it's not identical, and uh, some of the some of the power there is the, is the fact that it's not. So, okay, so, questions? So would, you, yep. would you say that this this expert system that you make is mostly rule driven, or is it uh, is it object oriented software, or what? How how would you characterize? It? Yeah. Um, uh, well, back back when we were actually doing this, uh, there was a uh, the inter uh, inter wars of is it rule based or is it object oriented or is it uh, you know there there are again I won't go into all the details of the technology and the technology fights but there was a bunch of that going on uh, and this particular one the GMAC one was uh, was very rule based uh, use one of our tools at Technology to uh, encode the uh, encode the knowledge and that sort of thing um, there was a great deal of um, conventional software underneath it because it, you, we had to essentially uh, acquire the information from account from existing accounting records. So you would grab the accounting records, download them into a certain form, and then again uh, analyze and uh, reorganize and all that. So um, and it would just be a separate database, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so does that answer the question? Does that get close, you know. <laughs> More. I think it might yeah. be useful if you describe briefly how a rule-based system works. Okay. Um, you know, what are the nature yeah, of the rules? Are yeah. they probabilistic? Are they pattern matching? Right. Okay. So yeah, very, the simplest version is um, uh, if-then rules with the predicate, uh, the, the the if part, uh, typically uh, looking at. Uh, symptoms or uh, something presenting itself, uh, right? And the then part, then um, making some conclusion about what do we know now? Okay. Often, uh, th then in, in the in the in that rules world, uh, there were some. Sometimes what you want to do is work forward from uh, the data that you've got to conclusions. And then conclusions from there, and then conclusions from there. Other times, what you want to do is start with, I want this goal, uh, and I back up. How am I going to get there? And I back up from there, and how am I going to get there? 
And so rule-based systems run forward or backward. Um, and once you've, got a, once you've got an idea of what the rules are, encoding them in an object-oriented fashion often makes a lot of sense. Uh, the company that I worked at after technology was called Coherent Thought, which was a brief uh, rocket in, in, the, uh, AI, uh, in the AI world. Um, and we were doing uh, a diagnostic uh, tool that diagnosis was at the center of the tool. And so, you know, some of the first class objects in that, uh, in that system were symptoms, tests, failures, um, uh, you know, so the, yeah, and, and then there were rules that would connect those things up, right? So, uh, again, I don't want to get too deep in the technology. Yeah, I, I once is, worked on a, um, a system where they, uh, where they were testing uh, manufactured semiconductor uh, circuits, and they would work backwards from the observed errors. They would, they would have built a big database of, of how you would get from here to there. And so when they got a particular error, they knew where to go back and look for the flaw. Right, right. Yeah, no, it, it, that, that, level, that, that kind of expertise is, yeah, is exactly the sort of thing that we were trying to encode. Okay, let's plunge ahead. So what did we learn? Um, experts lie, mostly for good reasons, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, each of these we'll talk a little bit more about. The meaning is in the expert system. You know, what, what did the SME say? What did I get from it? I re-engineered the thing, all that. But what the meaning really is is what's going on in the system itself. Uh, experts often work backwards. They begin with the goal in mind. Uh, so the, the, the backward thing, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the forward backward on the rule based stuff. If you also just simply watch the behavior of, a, of an expert while they're solving the problem, what we find is that often they're working backwards. So did those GMAC experts kind of start with the assumption that the business was going to fail and then work backwards until they found that it was true or not? Not, not quite. Um, yeah, yes, that's what I sort of mean. but. Um, the the details of the behavior are, are basically a level leveled down in detail. Uh, they don't really start with an answer in mind, but they start with let me look for characteristics that would indicate a potential problem. Okay, so they're they're looking for they're looking for characteristics, and it's the collection of characteristics then that uh, that, that really identify it. So anyway, again, it's, so. And that leads right into, you must build incrementally. Part of the problem we're having right now with carrying the GMAC thing another step is that I don't know enough to have the conversation, and you don't know enough that whatever the words I'm saying are going to make a lot of sense. So yeah, it's, because, and it's because we don't have a common vocabulary with this particular expertise in mind. And, um, and so building incrementally is just... We were doing, you know, I mean, we created many of the uh, methodological techniques that are now popular in software. You know, so Agile, you know, really is a particular instance of what we were doing back in the 80s with incremental build. Um, and, you know, there are, uh, uh, you know, the Brady Booch stuff, and all, a lot of the standard methodologies, um, we were... We were on the forefront in a lot of ways of building that stuff because we had to. Uh, the uh, you know the the nature of the expert system is you walk into a situation where you don't even know the vocabulary that the expert is using to communicate with you. So, so we're going to jump into each one of these things. So why do experts lie? Uh, the first thing is the whole truth would be overwhelming. If uh, you know if if I know something about you know this accounting issue. And I start in and, and just start telling you the, the, the nitty gritty uh, truth, uh, you as the knowledge engineer are not going to understand. Um, so uh, that, that makes a difference how good you are, how smart you are, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the whole truth will be overwhelming. It's a fire hose sort of problem. And uh, so, they, so they lie. They, they'll overgeneralize. Uh, they'll leave out edge cases. Uh, they'll, you know, experts lie. Um, the second reason is you don't know their technical vocabulary, so they will say something to you with a string of English words that means something to you that's not what they meant. Um, so whatever you got was a lie. 
uh, they omit key information that they've inter internalized. Um, uh, every expert and anything that you're expert at, you know, you've pushed it down below your level of consciousness most of the time where you're just doing stuff because you know it's the right thing to do. You're just going to do that next thing. And, uh, you, and you don't think about this is why I did it and it, you know, if then rule got triggered and you know, there, I, there I went. Uh, but you internalize the information and some of what that knowledge acquisition game is about is bringing out uh, the stuff that's, you know, well, how did you get there from here? And the answer is, I don't know. What, one of the universal things that happened with these projects is at the end of them, uh, the experts often would go, this has really been cool because now I kind of understand what I do. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't really understood what I, you know, understand what I did. Before, you know, anyway, it was, it was kind of neat. So the overgeneralized and meta-ed cases. Uh, and the conclusion that we did is we have to walk into the situation assuming that we don't understand that, every, you know, in each interaction, there's a, you know, strong chance that I misunderstood what the expert was just telling me. So I've got to keep options open. I've got to keep, you know, ambiguity. Uh, ambiguity tolerance was one of the uh, things that I used to teach our, our knowledge engineers is don't jump to the conclusion that you will really understand. One of, one of my buddies that uh, uh, came out of the uh, conventional software world was a IBM CICS guy for those transaction processing folks out there. Um, and uh, Frank did a job at uh, one of the big banks. I can't remember which one. It was Wells Fargo or Bank of America or somebody. Uh, and uh, they were going to do this project, and he got the group of like 70 or 80 developers, and he wanted to choose a team of two or three to, to work on this project. So he invited them to a talk in which he would explain the project and decide who was interested in, in joining the team and you know, started to do the internal recruiting. Uh, so he uh, started the talk. So he got you know, 40, 50 developers in the room, and he said, okay, so how many people have walked up to an uh, ATM machine, started to do a transaction, aborted it in the middle, and went inside and completed it inside the bank. And nobody raised their hand. Right? So, okay, how many people have walked up to an ATM transaction, started the transaction, and walked away with it from it without completing the transaction or without going inside the bank to, to complete? And nobody raised their hand. He says, okay, so what that tells us is there's nobody in this room that's qualified to do this project, <laughs> right? Because it wasn't a technology project, right? I mean, these were, but, but the developers were, were, they were supposed to solve the problem of a person walking up to an ATM machine and being confused, right? So uh, the, his, his point there really was, I don't want to hear about, you know, your fancy idea about how we might, you know, change the order of the screens or something. We got to figure out how to solve this problem for people that are not in this room, right? Uh, and anyway, so you really have to assume that you don't understand, you know. And in this, you know, in this particular case with Frank's thing, it was you, you don't really even understand what the person's problem is, and that's what we got. Yeah, that's what we got to figure out. Okay, so experts lie. Meaning is in the system. Uh, the meaning is what the system does. If the system doesn't do what I thought it was going to do, doesn't do what we programmed it to do, uh, doesn't do what, you know, you and I as the expert have figured out that we, it should do, then what we thought we did doesn't matter. Um, but one of the really interesting things about this process, it, you know, after the first little dance about, you know, who are you and who am I, and, you know, do we trust each other, and, you know, are, are you smart enough to keep up with me, and all of those kinds of dance. Uh, but shortly after that, the SME and the KE really became partners with, uh, and not, you know, it's your fault or it's my fault. It's how do we make the system smarter? What, what have we not encoded that we need to in order to get this one? One of the things we did here is uh, case-based acquisition, uh, which is uh, sit down with, a, uh, with the expert and say, in this particular case, what did you do and why did you do? And march from, you know, symptoms to, uh, you know, intermediate conclusions to, you know, the final conclusions and stuff. And how did you get there? And what did you do? And then, you know, then we encode that and then run it over cases like that. And then when you run it over cases like that, you'll find that they omitted an edge case or 
you know, there's an, there's another clause in the rule somewhere that uh, uh, that distinguishes another couple of cases that, that we haven't thought about. And it's that growth of um, knowledge over time that then makes the thing get smarter and smarter. But the SME and the KU partners, not opponents, was a, really an important piece of that, is that it became a joint effort to make the system smarter and not to argue with each other about who's right. So do you have good enough records to do this case-based study? I mean, how do, I mean, it'll be some old thing, right? And you're going back and saying, now, what did you do here? And right, right. Well, and, and, and uh, yeah, the, the pragmatics of these kinds of projects, uh, there were there were things like that, you know, where can we get access uh, to whatever records there were? Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, some of these things are awfully confidential. Uh, because it's, you know, if, if you're uh, doing engine diagnosis for General Motors, uh, you know, their their database of engine problems is not something that they want on the street. Uh, so anyway, the uh, um, yes, coming up with the cases was a good piece of the action. Uh, and sometimes it was uh, do them on the fly. You know, uh, the expert would be with us for, uh, you know, a week, uh, doing that acquisition and then go back to whatever their job is and we'd work on the, uh, the programming for three or four weeks and meanwhile they'd be collecting the next set of cases often you know often by the time we got into the project ways after the first few I increments uh, we would have an idea of scope where we knew that well we've handled this kind of problem but we haven't even started talking about this kind of so now go get some cases in that arena and let's you know we'll start working on that Part of the scope uh, in the next so it was mostly going forward and not analyzing old cases it, it depended on whether whether it was there some of some companies were good at, at having the uh, information but often it wasn't it wasn't very available it, or it wasn't available in a reasonable form uh, you know for you know, so constructing them on the fly was one of the things that we did a lot of. more questions nope all right let's keep rolling um, Goal-directed problem-solving, uh, experts work from the end goal in mind and then they move backwards. Uh, typically they work backward looking for how they might reach the goal, they know what they're looking for, uh, and they become experts uh, via uh, lots of experience uh, solving the class of problems. Again, this, the cases really are uh, often the, uh, uh, the, the center of this. Um, and it's really a meta, you know, it's a meta level comment that you watch the behavior and say, oh, I see what they're doing there. They kind of know where they're headed. And so they're looking for particular things. Um, so that this one's a, a bit amorphous and you know, sort of hard to describe, except uh, I'd encourage you to start paying attention as you interact with you know, somebody you consider an expert at something, how much they'll run things backwards. And I'll say a few more things about that with regard to our business in a little bit. All right, so why incremental build? Um, and we, we, I've said a few of these things already. We didn't have the vocabulary, uh, you know, so even the English words that go on with, you know, what does this mean? Um, we didn't have metrics. Uh, typically, you know, uh, one of them was, so here's an example, uh, Elf Aquitaine. Uh, we did a thing called the drilling advisor. Uh, the problem is you're drilling an oil well and this drill is actually a thing, you know, about yay big, but it's two miles deep in the, in the earth. And it's digging the hole, and it's stuck. And it was about a million dollars a day in lost uh, cost uh, for as long as that thing got stuck. So there was, there was a guy in France, a uh, French oil company. Uh, there was a guy in France who was their expert. They would fly him around the world. When the thing would get stuck, he'd go there and he'd do stuff, and you know, in a day and a half, he'd get it fixed. Uh, so uh, we uh, we built an expert system that mimicked his uh, uh, his knowledge. Now, when you walk into that, what? How come these things get stuck? <laughs> you know, and he, you know, he can start talking, you know, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, you know, talk that you, you, you have no idea what I mean. And even the, the regular English words they'll say is, you know, well, it's, you know, the, the, the drill bit is spinning at X uh, 
uh, cycles per second, and uh, that ge generates some friction. And that, that, you know, all those words. Yeah, I mean, see, now I'm saying things that you would understand, but you don't really understand because you don't know what he really means by those words. So friction is something. Yeah, we all kind of know, about, right? but not necessarily in this context. So did he visualize what was going on down there a mile or so deep? And, and I mean, did he manipulate it in his mind somehow? What, what, what was he doing? <laughs> Again, I wasn't on the project, so I, uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, uh, it's a trade secret. No, 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 no. That, that actually, when we, we, we were able to talk about that one for uh, actually pretty close to when we were doing it. it was, we didn't have that long of a lag time. Before we can talk about that. Anyway, um, what was he doing? Uh, there were, I'm, I'm digging up old, old memory. Um, there were different kinds of stiction problems. Sometimes it was, you know, I mean, imagine this, you know, this, you know, what now is about as, you know, if it's two miles deep and it's this, this big around, imagine a straw, you know, that I'm drilling a hole in the floor, right, with the straw, uh, right? And meanwhile, of course, it's going through, you know, a bunch of crap in the, in the middle. And sometimes the stiction was up here somewhere, right? Because the drill itself got out of whack. And when, you know, and you're, you're trying to, do, and this, you know, it's, it's crooked, right? You know, so is it that kind of problem, or is it that way down there at the bit, drill bit at the end, where it's, you know, in something sticky, you know, or it's in something wet, or, you know, something. I don't, anyway, I don't know what, they, what he did. Uh, but it's that kind of conversation, it's that kind of interaction, where you, you know, where he's got to let you know what really the issues are. And there's, you know, 18 different kinds of problem and all that. So anyway, it's... Um, so, yeah, I mean, how do you even decide which of the sub-problems you're going to work on first, right? Are you going to work on the ones that the drill bit's way down there and it's stuck? Are you going to work on the one where the thing's stuck halfway? You, you know, you don't even know whether that's a way, even a, a good way to cut it up, right, until you're into it a ways. So, we built the first deliverable as quickly as possible to have something to work with. And the first deliverable is typically very narrow, not very accurate, but it gives you specific questions to ask the expert to make it smarter and more comprehensive. Okay, so we would build something, boom, and start running cases. And sometimes they do half right, and yeah, but this is sort of right, but not not quite. And here's why. And then that would generate more rules and more distinctions, more vocabulary, and more metrics. So. Uh, so we had to do incremental depth. It was just the only way, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, from a project management perspective, um, what we used to tell our customers is uh, pick, a, pick a budget and pick a time frame, and we'll work to that budget over that time frame. At the end of that time frame, evaluate what we've done, and if you think it was worthwhile, we'll continue, and if you don't, you get to kick us out. Uh, and, you know, and of course, we were highly motivated to stay in, and they were highly motivated to stay in. I mean, typically these problems were, you know, big time problems that they really wish they could solve, you know, like the GMAC. Uh, so uh, we would get in and get something little done and uh, get working with the expert and get m more knowledgeable with the conversation and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and so incremental build. Questions? Because now I'm going to switch gears. All right, let's roll. All right, so now I'm going to switch over to technical communication. And you might find that this picture looks a little alike. This is the picture I showed you back at the beginning of where we were headed. And this is what I think we do as technical communicators. Is we've got a writer in the middle here that's taking the uh, knowledge engineers task. And I think that really is what you guys do. I think you really are knowledge engineers uh, who take information from subject matter experts, documents themselves, the source code, the running app, you know, whatever, you know, wherever you're getting uh, the information from. And so that's the, you know, very similar activity here for knowledge acquisition. Sometimes you have access to a subject matter expert, sometimes you don't. 
uh, you know, those of us who have worked with good ar uh, software architects, uh, you know, find them invaluable. You know, if you've got a, if you've got an architect is articulate and can you know, tell you what the system's supposed to be doing and all that kind of stuff, you're, you're lucky and it really speeds our job. Um, but sometimes you just have to work, you know, and sometimes you have the pseudo experts who are people that, you know, you know the, the developer on some subset who thinks they know what the project, product does and it doesn't do it. So you've got the knowledge acquisition part. There's the, men, the mental modeling. And it's very similar to what we do. Um, it, the, you know, the, the software app, the, what the developers tell you, et cetera, needs to be re-engineered and remodeled for use by the user, you know, by the, by the person who's going to make use of this, this piece. Right? So uh, there's the mental modeling. And then there's the presentation. Uh, I, I wrote pres present there rather than, than write because I think in modern terms, we're talking about Camtasia or uh, videos or, or documents or you know, training programs or you know, sales engineering presentations or you know, I don't know, whatever. Uh, so the, the presentation, the, 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 this is make something out of it. And then you have your reader who consumes those things and makes their own mental model. Uh, so notice a, a lot of parallel here, uh, you know, in terms of what the model looks like. Um, and, but I think this, and I think this helps articulate some of what makes really good writers really good writers. Uh, and in particular, I have a particular prejudice which says most people think that the key thing about writing is being a good writer, you know, and getting, you know, taking the adverbs out of the middle of a uh, infinitive clause, right? No split infinitives. That's what writing's about. Well, that's not. <laughs> I mean, I, I, mean I, I believe in split infinitive. I, uh, in, in avoiding. <laughs> to uh, unintentionally split an infinitive is wrong. <laughs> Intentionally to do so, however, is not. <laughs> so, so yes. Uh, um, anyway, so but I, I think it's not just the writing; it's it's the mental modeling, and it's that re-engineering to take the you to, you know to take the reader's point of view and what about this do they need to know in order to do the task they're they're after. Okay, so that's uh, that's the model, and let's then revisit some of these things that. Uh, uh, that we talked about here. So experts lie, uh, and these things, <clears throat> these things come right back. Uh, you know, the first time you're talking to the, you know, the architect about what this, uh, you know, big software application is all about, uh, they can't tell you the whole truth because it's an uh, overwhelming. Um, you don't know their technical vocabulary. You know, they, they'll say a word like widget, and you don't know whether that means just any old thing or it means a particular class in the object hierarchy at you know some level of the. Uh, they admit key information they've internalized. Um, developers do that for sure. <laughs> Overgeneralize them in edit cases. And this one's new for, for us, which is often the experts aren't the experts. Uh, the, the person that you're assigned, if we get this, you know, at, at, uh, at expert support, we often get the weakest developer on the team is the one assigned to talk to the technical writer. And right. what about the brand new employee? The guy, the guy that doesn't, the, the guy that does that's not on any development schedule, critical path, is the guy that's, you know, you, 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 that's you. and they're not experts. Okay, so, and that, and that does cause, you know, that does cause some issues. So you, you just have to do a little more work. Uh, you have to take what they say, you have to re-engineer it, see if it works, and maybe doesn't, and then you got to you know, re-engineer some more. So the some are not really experts is, some, is one that's uh, kind of peculiar to us. But, but I think the other thing is that walking into a, uh, to a new gig, you really assume that you don't really understand what the words are. Um, one of our best uh, knowledge engineers, uh, MSAI out of Stanford, uh, and worked with the uh, eMyson program as a, uh, you know, when she got done with her master's program, really, really sharp. Uh, and I was using her as my subject matter expert when we were teaching other people to do what she did. 
So we were teaching people to be knowledge engineers. Uh, I was I was a trainer guy, uh, and so I was using Carly as the uh, as the expert. And we decided we we're going to do video. We're going to get a video. We're going to get a uh, uh, mechanic, uh, local mechanic in Palo Alto that uh, was known as you know the really good mechanic in Palo Alto, and do a uh, a sample interview where she interviewed uh, this person to show the sort of thing you would do in an expert interview. And um, so we, we did the video, and it turned out that uh, the lesson that we learned in there was that she did everything wrong in that interview. Mm -hmm. So we had, a great, we had a great view of how not to do it. And the reason was that she didn't follow this, that she thought she knew something about cars, and so in interacting with the expert, she kept asking questions about, so how do you decide whether it's a transmission problem or an engine problem? And the expert would go, I don't know. And it turned out that that wasn't the way he did things. It was, he, he didn't you know, separate it into different kinds of problem. He looked at symptoms and took it forward to what he was looking for. And when he finally had the answer, that's the first time he knew what kind of problem, you know, what, this classification. So Carly was running from the classification side of things because she had picked up, you know, Chilton's auto manual and said, okay, it was transmission problems. And thought she knew what she was talking about, and she didn't. And that interaction with the two, with the conversation was, you know, they were, they were missing conversation. And, you know, she would ask a question, and he would go, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's like, didn't make, it, it just didn't make sense. So anyway, that's, that's a good one. Meanings in the system. Uh, and in this case, you know, we all get this. Meaning is what the reader gets. Uh, what you wrote down doesn't necessarily help. What the reader took away from it, uh, what they're able to do at the point of finishing reading what, or doing or watching whatever video or whatever, uh, what you meant doesn't matter. Um, you and the software guys that you're working with are partners, not, uh, not opponents. And the joint problem is what can we do to make the documentation better? And I think that's one of the key things that you've got to get you know, socially entwined with the developers to get them, you know, so you're, you're both looking at the documentation as there's our opponent. You know, the, the, the documentation as in its current state is what we need to fix. Uh, and it's not your fault, it's not my fault, it's, it's where it is right now, let's go, let's go make it smart. Um, so, uh, goal-directed problem solving. Now, this, this one you know, is a little bit of a twist. The best writers I know uh, they know what information the audience needs in order to perform their tasks, right? So the best API writers are people that have been a little bit, uh, been developers or no developers or have been around developers or, you know, whatever. They know what the developers want, and then they figure out how to get it for them, right? So, uh, again, they're working backwards from knowing what the audience needs. They know how to present information so that the readers can assimilate it. They know how to distill and organize information to make it easier to consume. So the organization thing, that mental modeling line, uh, you know, the you know, really good writers do knowledge engineering. They, they reorganize and they, they, they restructure the information so that it's uh, in a form that's more easily digestible. Uh, and then they, they know how to get raw information from a variety of sources because you've got to read code or uh, run the app or... Uh, read the existing crappy documentation or you know, talk to the developers or, you know, whatever in order to get uh, uh, the information you need to get. Um, the incremental build lessons I think to come up with here is uh, assume you don't have any green pond terminology. One of the things that I tell our people uh, when we're out on a gig, even if the customer is not paying for a glossary, the first thing we do is start building a glossary uh, because the words that they're saying, they'll over they'll overuse one. They'll use a term that really means two or three different things if you look at the key distinctions in the in the product, or they'll use different terms for the same thing because you know last year they were calling it this, and this year they decided let's change the name. Or the marketing guys came in and said we got to change the words, uh, you, know, you know whatever. Uh, but that terminology wriggle vocabulary wriggle is something that we have to stamp out. 
mean, we have to figure out what are we going to call the thing. And if it's there's two things that are synonyms, then fine, let's make them synonyms. But if but they're typically not. They're typically some fine distinction, uh, and you know we need to know what that fine distinction is in order to be clear to our to our uh, readers what what's going on. So, um, but so assume you don't have an agreed upon terminology and go go build it. Uh, look for metrics that define scope and progress. Um, uh, again, this, this is I can only really kind of point at um, you know, the generic thing of just try to do that. Uh, you know, how are you going to say I'm you know two thirds done with the project? Uh, what are the metrics? Is it pages? No, well, not necessarily. If I, if I'm if I'm still cracking the nut of what is this thing doing? I haven't necessarily written much down that's very useful, uh, right? So, you know, but then you've got to figure out what what can what metrics can give you progress for figuring out what's going on. Uh, anyway, so look looking for metrics to define uh, what's the scope of the of the job, and how do how do I know I'm making progress and finishing the job? Uh, build the first deliverable as quickly as possible to have something to work with. Um, now this one's this one's a little double-edged sword for us, I think, uh, because one of the one of the problems that you can have as a writer is writing something that's so much fiction that as soon as you put it in front of somebody, they go, "Well, you don't know what you're talking about, so I don't want to talk to you." Um, you know, you're incompetent. I don't want to deal with this. Yeah, there's there's no. Sorry. At least three times in my career, I've replaced writers in government. Yes. I mean, I wasn't the one who chose to replace them. I'd go interview for something, and they say, yeah, you get it. And then they say, well, I've got to put something out too quick. And it's garbage. And then it's yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, so I still believe in this, in this general heuristic, you know, that gets something in front of people that, you know, that will make the specific questions. You can ask the specific questions about, does this work this way or that way? You know, is this copy semantics or share semantics? You know, or, you know, you can get some of those questions articulated by writing a lot of what's there, and then, but you really do have to do the uh, the sales job that says, um, you know, this is not even a rough draft yet. <laughs> this is uh, this is my working notes that I'm going to turn into the rough draft. Straw man, straw man, you know, whatever. You but you got to you got to develop the working relationship in order to have this one work in our world, because you think, do. This is what I think. I do. Yes, right, exactly. Well, I, I, I always quote the old par proverb, uh, never show a fool something half done. And I, I say, see, this proves I trust you. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, well, I see. I, I, I think, uh, from my perspective, a lot of these uh, uh, suggestions are you know run the gamut of the life cycle. You know, it, things that you can apply right up front. Um, one of the uh, one of the papers that we have on our on our website is a thing on uh, spec methodology for specifying information project products, and uh, one of the I don't have it in this presentation. Um, uh, I think often when we say here's what we're going to do, we outline the content, and it's typically an outline or you know a, a set of organization. an organization of what I'm going to say in the in the midst of it. For me, content is one of six features uh, that I want to acquire up, up front. Uh, I want to know business objectives. I want to know why are we doing this project at all. I want to know technical objectives. What change am I trying to induce in the reader that they don't already have? Right? I want to know audience. I want to know what am I? What, what do I get to assume about the audience? What you know? What are they? Uh, uh, you know? What are they like? Uh, how do they? What, what's their vocabulary, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you have audience issues, um, business objectives, technical objectives, audience, media. What's the appropriate media for transmitting the information that we're about to do? 
Uh, and the, la the, the last one is pattern of use, which uh, uh, is, is what are they going to do with it? Is this going to be bathroom reading that, you know, they read, they read the novel, put it down, and then you know, tomorrow pick it up again and read some more? Or is this something they put on the shelf and they pull it down when it's time to say, how, you know, where does that semicolon go? Uh, you know, so pattern, I mean, that, that's two extremes of, uh, you know, the kinds of things one might do with a piece of paper. Uh, but uh, anyway, so pattern of use is another one. I think that if you, if you get those into the spec of when you're starting, uh, then, you know, some of these, you know, I mean, basically, it's it's a bunch of this stuff. So sometimes I'll do I'll do a, I'll, I'll put a spec in front of uh, the, the uh, client in order to uncover what they're really after. Uh, often people come to us and say, you know, I need an installation manual, you know, and you know that they probably do, but that may or may not be the prime business objective of what what they're after, right? So, so if you go in with an outline, aren't you making the mistake that Carly made in the example you gave of, of assuming a certain structure of uh, the answer? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, only if only if you take that as that's the outline, yeah. and not as this is what I know now. Uh, this is this is what I'm thinking. Tell me, you know, tell me if it makes sense. And uh, and I always I always say that the spec is a is a living working document, and I, you know, I, I mess with that as we go, especially for me, business objectives are something that the customer doesn't always tell you accurately and completely up front. Um, experts lie, uh, you know, and, and they, they don't always, often really even know what their, their you know, real objectives are. We've, we did a project for Yahoo back a ways uh, in which um, th what they wanted us to rewrite some help pages. Uh, you know, mail and uh, some of the other Yahoo products, a messenger, and I don't know, there was a five or six of the, product, of the uh, properties. And they wanted us to redo the help uh, because they realized that the help pages weren't very helpful. And um, on the pages were, was the, you know, was this page helpful, yes or no? And their satisfaction ratings were X, and they wanted to improve that. Um, so as we got into the project, we figured out, okay, that is how they're going to measure uh, our progress and um, and so we want to drive that number up, right? So we rewrote a bunch of uh, uh, pages and got no movement in the number, uh, and we thought that was pretty disappointing. Um, but then we figured out that, uh, and it was one of those uh, bring your head on the platter to the uh, to the customer. Um, the the Pro the, the problem that we figured out was people were getting to the wrong page. If you were on, you were in mail, and you had a particular problem of, you know, and you would hit the help button, it would take you to a page that was not relevant to what you what you were just doing. So you might have been in, you know, the compose part. You're composing a new message, and you would help, and it tells you how to, you know, send it or how to read your mail or you know something. And so you were on the wrong page. So you, you would say, no, it's not helpful. Uh, so w when we figured that out and told them it was their search algorithm that was whack, they didn't like that. I mean, yeah, Yahoo's a search not. company, <laughs> but they especially didn't like it when, when we, we showed them the Google search that got to the right page Whoops. and the Yahoo search that got to the wrong page. <laughs> so that was that was a uh, that was a uh, social interaction nightmare. <laughs> As consultants, sometimes you have to do that. Um, so conclusions. Um, assume that you don't really understand what your sources are telling you. Uh, and, and and I think it's, it's really a matter of, of just tell yourself that over and over again. Is do I really get it? Do I, do, am I really capturing what they're saying? Um, uh, learn about your audience and what their tasks are. Uh, find an, 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 you know, examples of excellent documentation. That's the backward, uh, the goal-directed thing is uh, I think most of us learned to write by reading, right? And so if you want to be a good technical writer, I think looking at good examples of good technical writing um, you know, is a good thing. So I mean, it's one of the things that Tom recommends in, in his API course is go look at some good ones. So I, and I think, so I think that's, a, that's a thing. And then the get started quickly and use early drafts as a learning tool um, and uh, with that caveat that we talked about.
Questions? Well, I got to tell you the end, the ending of the GMAC story. Um, we were in beta, and uh, they just, and while we were in beta testing, and there was a whole bunch of infra infrastructure stuff with EDS to work out and all that stuff, but we were in beta testing, and um, there was an eight million dollar default. Uh, it was a fraudulent one. Guy ran off to the Bahamas with you know a pile of money, and uh, so. They, uh, they decided that they would take the system as it was, and it was in beta, and back up and run it for the last you know, couple of years. And the system caught the problem about a year in advance, and they could have, they could have taken some steps to you know, cut this guy's uh, uh, credit line or whatever, uh, you know, all the steps that they would normally do. So uh, the, the, the project ended up being something like a $7 million project between us EDS and AMS when we for building the system by the time we got it all deployed and all that stuff. So seven million from GMAC out. So there was also cost inside GMAC. So it was like a seven million dollar project with an eight million dollar ROI of minus six months. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, so they, they were they were pretty motivated at that point to get the tool out there. And, and uh, that project was the first one that had sun machines inside General Motors. Uh, that that project was the entry point for EDS had never touched Sun before. Uh, this was in 1980, 1986, seven, something like that. And uh, EDS was it you know, was a straight uh, IBM and Dell. So that was those were the first thirty two bit workstations. Uh, yeah, no, and and uh, yeah, they, so the the Sun boxes were, what we were running the analysis programs on. And so the, it, this was, you know, thirty thousand dollar personal computers at the time. You probably ran into some of my documentation. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on the sun, yep. Yeah, I documented that. So. Yep, yep. <laughs> All right. More. I got stories too, so you can you can ask me stories. Story type questions. One of the one of the fun ones I always tell people is uh, uh, AI lab uh, when we were working. Uh, at the Stanford AI lab in grad school. And uh, every year, the local, one or another of the local uh, TV stations would come up to sale, uh, the Stanford AI lab, uh, and uh, probably take two hours worth of video on what was going on there. We had the hand-eye ear project. Uh, so it was a, a mechanical arm uh, with vision and with uh, speech understanding. And, you know, so you could say, you know, go pick up the green ball and it would you know, go over and pick up the green ball if it all worked. Uh, and uh, so early, early robotic stuff. It was really, really kind of cool stuff. Um, and the, they would, the TV stations would come and shoot all this. Uh, and, and on the 11 o'clock news, they would seconds. typically show 45 <laughs> seconds or a, or a minute. And what they always showed was the prancing pony. Now the prancing pony was a vending machine that one of the engineers just hooked up with a patch panel interface to a TTY, so that you could go and type in your initials, and it would let you buy oranges from the machine for the thirty-five cents for the orange or whatever. And we stock we stocked the machine ourselves. You know, we people would just go to the you know the, the prancing pony was like a little co-op, and uh, you could. You know, type in your initials and get your get your orange or your pot stickers or whatever. In fact, we started putting change in some of the doors so that you could actually you know buy your bus money if you wanted to. Uh, and then and then we had double or nothing on it. So you, you when you typed in your initials, you could hit you know and I want to bet, and it would do a 50-50 on whether it was double or nothing. <laughs> so the the fifty or fifty double or nothing thing gamification right so one of the one of the words today out there <laughs> gamification and every time over a period of, this is a period of like five years and you know like once a year one of it and they would always show the fencing pony and they would never show the hand that stuff <laughs> yeah it was, it was, it was very, very interesting very I have time. yes so um, I guess we all have some experience or with uh, audience and task analysis. Yes. So would you just say how you think that fits and, and, and what, how you think people should go about it, how formal, what techniques? And... 
yeah, I'm not an expert in that particular. I know it's important. It's exactly what we did with the expert on the expert system side of things. Uh, I'm not a writer, by the way. I just employ writers. Sure. <laughs> you guys are you guys are the guys that uh, that do the work. Um, but uh, yes, audience and task analysis I think is key. Uh, there are you know books out there and you know et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and uh, you know I think a lot of it is is wanting to. You know, I mean, I think really taking the the, the point of view that says I need to know about my audience and I need to know what they're doing. You know, so I mean, in, in an API writer sort of sense, you got to do a little program. You know, I mean, even if you're a writer that doesn't program, I don't care, that's fine. You got to do a little programming. You got to sit down with you know JavaScript and make do something just so you know what developers do. Um, you know, and you know, and then the more you, you know, the more you run down that that road of learning how. You don't have to be a professional. I mean, you know, by no means you had to be able to create something from scratch and, you know, know all the details of some, uh, uh, you know, object system or, you know, whatever. Um, one, of the, one of the guys I used to train with uh, at Technology, that was one of my trainers, uh, uh, was his, his heuristic was it takes you a week to learn an object-oriented language. And then it takes you a week per class for all of the classes in the class language. Yeah. Ah. And so, you know, you, you, you walk into any substantial uh, object system, you know, and it's a year's worth of work to really, really understand. Um, so because there's, you know, 50-ish, you know, fundamental classes, you know, you have to really understand to really rock the whole system. Or, you know, in my experience, a programmer is given a job and he, he, he has to use this class library. That's the mountain to climb. Yes. It's not the syntax or, Correct. or even understanding the problem. It's, right. It's what's in the, what's in the library. What do I already have? Uh, what do I don't have to reinvent? Um, yeah, etc. Right. No, exactly. And many of the uh, uh, the documentation of the early object oriented systems didn't address that issue. They just you know would put out you know here's the methods and here's you know uh, you know the, uh, the hidden variables and the public variables and uh, you know all that stuff. But that doesn't tell you what's in the library and why would you want one. And that's really what the audience needed. So yes, so the, I mean, that, there's a there's a good example of the task audience thing. Um, more. Don't let me off the hook. Let me off the hook easy. Thank you. All right. Yep, you're, you're welcome. And, uh, and like I said, the uh, one of the ones that I'm really kind of looking forward to is I really want to do a little bit of this modeling thing. So uh, um, uh, that, that'll be a that'll be a to do for this year, and maybe Tom will invite you back. Well, you'll you'll see it in the I previews. <laughs> you'll see the previews of that. One. Be very soon. And uh, we'll have this. Recording.